All right, so we're talking about chapter three this week. Chapter three is focusing on the application layer protocol. So if I were to quickly just throw up the OSI model, we're right here on layer seven, first layer. And what did I say when it comes to this layer? What was the sole purpose of this layer, layer seven that is? Act as an interface between the client using application and the server or another client receiving the response. So when we look at the application layer, we're going to be focusing on two things, apps and services. Apps are client-based software. An example of an app would be like a web browser. Whereas a service is a software that's installed on a server and which is constantly running, listening for requests. An example, going back to our web page, would be if I want to access the World Wide Web, I must have some kind of web browser installed. In order for that web, web browser to display a web page, that web page must be stored on a server. And that server must have a particular service running on it. That particular service is known as HTTPD. The D is short for daemon, which is another name for a service. And you can think of it as where they came up with it. The daemons possess people. Well, services possess servers. In fact, sometimes we call these services processes. And they constantly run in the background listening to the network. As a web user, I'm going to make a request. For me to make a request, I'm going to become a client. And there must be some device out there that's going to fulfill my request. If there isn't, I'm just going to get a page cannot be found. And so in this model, we're going to come to learn the client-server relationship. And basically, all forms of communications can be boiled down to this essence model, where a client makes a request or initiates the data exchange, and a server fulfills that request. Now, I don't want you guys to get pigeonholed to thinking that servers are special boxes that you have to go out and spend exuberant amount of money. That would be the case if you are running a high-end professional network, okay? But for a home or a small local area network, you might be able to take a desktop, one of your old PCs, set it aside, install maybe Linux on it, or maybe a Windows server. It depends on how much processing power you have on this desktop. But the idea is you're setting it aside. You're saying it's not going to be used for everyday applications. But rather, it's going to be running all the time, listening to requests that your clients, the people on your network, are going to be making. Now, remember how we define a local area network? By its geographical proximity, the fact that it's managed by a single organization or user, and also by the types of data that travel across your network. And one thing we're seeing in our local area networks today is the fact that our data is becoming a little bit more complex. You can attest to this just simply by looking at the World Wide Web. Look how much video stuff is being posted on web pages. It's almost hard pressed to the, find a web page that loads simple and fast without any plugins. And most of those ads, most of those videos are just ads, whether it's for a movie trailer or whatever. But the point is, is that our connections are becoming broader. They're providing us with better quality of service, hence, the quality of our applications improve. What do we call this? Escalation, right? As one thing gets better, another thing has to get better. As criminals become smarter, what happens to our detectives? They have to get smarter, correct? Likewise, as our services improve, so will our experience. The idea is that services run on servers, and they run all the time. They have to be lean and mean. 
whereas applications run on the clients. And they're just special purpose. I need, a, I need something done. This is what I'm going to go to do. For example, if I need to browse the World Wide Web, I open up a web browser. If I need to write a paper, I open up what? Word. Now we are making this transition to where Word and other future applications are going to be stored on the cloud. Like Microsoft Office 2013. It's going to have web apps. What's the trade-off between traditional apps and web apps? That traditional apps are installed on that particular device. And that means in order for you to access them, you have to be on that device. Whereas web apps are stored anywhere around the world. And therefore, as long as you have a connection to that, you can access web apps. Web apps? Yeah, oh, you web. mean like they're going to do with Word apps? I got you. And so with web apps, we can see that we are accessing it from anywhere on any device on any platform at any time. So we're changing this model. But regardless, if you have a web app, it's going to be stored on a server. And when you try to access it, you become a client. So in today's lab, we're going to explore, if there's time, three principles of the application layer. Before I get into those principles, I would like to talk about the difference between a hub and a switch. And the reason why I need to get into this is because that will affect how apps and services will behave. The next thing I'll do is get into creating a DHCP client slash server network. And like I said, if there's time, we'll get into email services. There is a thin line to a network administrator's responsibility. And that is how much of it is hardware and how much of it is software. Most of the time, network administrators are rolling into an environment that's already established. And their responsibility is to keep it running, to fix any problems, to benchmark, to regulate performance. But occasionally, new technologies emerge. And we have to either update, create, or modify existing network structures. When that happens, you might find yourself wearing a couple of hats, being the engineer, the administrator, and maybe even the software person. It all depends on how big your network is, uh, sorry, how big your organization is, and whether they can afford having many IT people that are specialized in particular fields or just a jack of all trades, master of none. Okay, folks? So in this course, being that it's a fundamentals course, you guys will get a foundation of all the different pieces that come into a network environment, like installing software, setting up software, implementing hardware, and actually observing the behavior of this. Okay? So we're going to start off working with the hardware, and then by the end of lab, we'll get into software. Okay? So I want you guys to know you're going to be changing your hats from here to here. Open up Packet Tracer. Now eventually I will get into oops, excuse me. Eventually I'll get into putting my packet tracer files on Blackboard and telling you guys, please go out there, download this, and let's come to class running as we go. Okay, folks? Today we're gonna start this file from scratch just so we can iron out any wrinkles of using packet tracer. I know it's a new application, so I wanted to get you guys familiar with once again the layout of packet tracer, setting things up. So you're going to want us to put this on a flash drive at home or something like that? Uh, if I post it on Blackboard, I'll just have you download it in class and we'll start working in it during lab. Okay. But for today and probably next week, what I'll do is just have us create it from scratch. The idea is that I don't want to have to keep on going back creating networks. It'll get boring from time to time. Dropping a PC, configuring a PC, when what I really want to do is learn about how email works. What I really want to do is learn how routers are communicating with each other. You know, so after a few couple of weeks of doing this, I want you guys to feel comfortable of creating a network, and then I'm going to start expecting you guys to be able to do that 
And by me expecting it, that means I'll just be handing you files that have the network part already done. Now you have to start going in and configuring them. Okay? So in other words, we're not going to be doing what we're going to do right now. And that is, I need you guys to come down here to end devices. I'm going to create two networks. One's going to be with a hub, and the other one's going to be with a switch. Each network are going to have three PCs. So instead of wasting my time clicking and clicking from back and forth, I'm going to hold my control key, and I'm going to click on the very first end device, a generic PC. I'm going to make a little triangle. And I'm going to do the same thing over here. And then after I get done dropping six PCs, I'm going to hit the escape key on my keyboard. Remember, holding that control key allows us to lock that tool to our cursor. So everywhere I click on that logical workspace, I'm dropping a new component. So this network should contain three PCs, PC0, 1, and 2. And this one's going to contain three PCs as well, 3, 4, and 5. Now, it's not quite a network. In order for this to be a network, I have to have these connected together. I don't feel like running a cable from this computer then down to that computer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop an intermediary device. There are two types of intermediary devices I can use for a local area network, a hub and a switch. Both of those devices can be found down here in the lower left corner. I'm going to hover over the third icon in on the first row of the components box. It should say hubs. Then I'm going to click on the very first generic hub. And I'm going to take my cursor and put it right between my first triangle. So now I have a hub and three computers around the outside edge of it. I'm going to do the same thing with the other network, but this time I'm going to choose a switch. Choose the very first switch. And then I'm going to drop it right between these three devices. So Brian, do I have a network? No. All right. But I did meet one part of the network, correct? And that is I have two or more end devices. What's the next part I should put to make this closer to being a network? Yeah, I need to connect them. So uh, in the interest of saving time, I'm going to use the lightning bolt. But if I was actually implementing this in the real world, what type of cable should I use to connect the PCs to the hub or the PCs to the switch? Straight through. Remember, the only time you use a crossover is when you connect like devices together. A switch and a PC are not like devices. So like I said, in the interest of saving time, I'm going to come down, click on the quick connect. Hold the control key before I click on the auto connect. And then I'm going to click on PC0, hub0, PC1, hub0, PC2, hub0. And then I can do the same thing with the same tool. I'm going to go over here to PC3, click on switch. PC4, click on the switch. And last, PC5, click on the switch. I'm going to hit the escape key to drop that tool. And you should notice, right off the bat, there's a difference between the hub and the switch. When I connect a PC to a hub, the hub lights go green right off the bat. When I, collect, when I connect the switch and the PCs together, those lights aren't going green. They're going to take some time. This is showing you a sign of intelligence, right? Now, of course, you can save time by hitting the fast forward button. But I'm going to let that just soak a little bit, because I want you to know that a switch introduces latency to a network. Now, most people have been told that if you're going to set up a network at home, a switch is the way to go. They never explained why. They just said, do it. They're cheaper. Just buy it. Don't bother with a hub. In this demonstration, we're going to learn why a switch is better than a hub for certain purposes. It's not always go with the switch. Sometimes a hub will have a purpose. One thing we can learn is that a switch, just in itself when it boots up, will introduce latency. And the reason behind that is because a switch is an intelligent device. It can understand frame or physical addresses. Remember in yesterday's demonstration, I was having you guys open up the envelope, check to see if it was yours, 
put it back in the same damn envelope you opened it up, change the addresses, and send them back through. What happens if I told you, or what would have happened if I told you, just pass it down? Just pass it down. Don't bother reading it, just pass it down. What would have gotten the message to the end user faster? Passing it down method, or the opening, expecting, and then re-encapsulating and passing it down? Obviously just the passing it down and ignoring whatever's in its contents. That principle of actually processing it as you go is called latency. The time it takes for it to be processed is known as latency. The more smarter devices we add to our network, the intelligent our network becomes. The more control we have on our network, however, the longer the lag exists. Latency is never a good thing. However, it's like a, oh, I don't know, a teeter tot. When you sacrifice performance, you better gain something in return. When I'm sacrificing my latency, and that is how long it takes for the first packet to get there and come back around, I better be getting something in exchange for that. And what might I be getting? Well, a, secu a switch can introduce security. Absolutely. Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> the other thing that I could gain is that the switch can be managed. And I can do qu quality of service. And I can say, you know what, PC5, since you're the king of this household, I'll let you send out three packets for every one packet that PC3 and PC4. Do you see how PC5 will have a better perceived performance? Because the switch is saying, OK, one, two, three, now send you guys out. Having more control allows me to allocate my resources a lot better. So why would anybody ever want to use a hub then? And that's what we're going to explore. So after we get done establishing this and learning what a hub does and what a switch does, we will see that actually a hub, believe it or not, can offer another layer of security that a switch cannot. Even though it's insecure, we can exploit this vulnerability to actually offer us better security. The suspense I know is killing you. Brian, what else am I missing? What else do I need to make this a network? Protocol, yeah, let's give, these, let's give these devices an IP address. Question, before I get in there, and it's probably taboo to do this in a lecture environment because it's going to cause some confusion, but in the real world, would it be okay to use the same addresses on this network, on that network? What was the rule? No two devices on the same network can have the same IP address, correct? You got it. Ian's saying that, hey, they're two different networks. Unless I were to take a cable from this switch and hook it up to that hub, there should be no problem. If I were to take two routers and then connect them together, that would still be OK. Because a router connects networks together. However, if I take a cable and hook up the switch to this hub, then it will not be OK. Because these two devices are local devices. They're intermediary devices for a local area network. They're not designed to connect networks together. In other words, they'll still create one broadcast domain. It's chapter five stuff. I'm laying down the foundation for you guys. All right? So let's click on PC0. I'm going to click on the desktop tab. I'm going to click on IP configuration. Then in the IP address box, I'm going to type in 192.168.1.1. I know I'm not being very creative. I'm using the standard address. Can you guys click on the subnet mask and the 3255 should appear? 192 is what you want. 192? Yep. Dot one sixty eight. Dot one dot one. Yep. And then you hit the tab, and it should uh, appear with the two fifty fives, right? Okay. Let's close out of that dialog box, and then close out of the configuration box, and let's go up to PC one. Question. Yes. Is there any packet trace or shortcut to jump from one PC on the network to the no, other? No, unfortunately, there isn't. Sure, they want you to do it every time. 
in fact, that we're doing it. So we're going to type in 192.168.1.0. Oh, I don't know. Michael, what do you suggest? Two? two? Yeah, why not? Next address in line, correct? Click on the subnet mask. Life is good. I should have three 255s. Let me close out of this. Let's click on PC2. Desktop, IP configuration, IP address of 192.168.1.3. Hit the tab key. Close out. Why don't you guys see if you can do it for the other for the PCs? Other and please use the same one. So PC0 would be the equivalent of PC3, OK, guys? So this is going to be 192.168.1.1. Trust me, Ian, if there was a shortcut, I would have found it by now. <laughs> but I can give you a little cut, copy, paste shortcut. You can just cut, copy the uh, IP address. You got it. It'll save you two nanoseconds. Yeah, save your knuckles. There you go. You know, as time is going on, you might be noticing that the lights of a switch are constantly flickering, whereas the lights of a hub do not. The only time the lights on a hub flicker is when data is actually being transmitted. In fact, that is generally the rule. The only time the lights flicker on a cable is when there's voltage on it. So that means the switch is actually putting data on the wire. What is that data that the switch is doing? Well, the switch is just updating its uh, MAC table, making sure everybody's there, whereas the hub doesn't do that. The hub doesn't matter, because whatever it receives, it sends to everybody. Whereas a switch, a switch will develop relationships between the port and whoever's plugged into it. So that once the switch is established, a switch won't bother everybody that's hooked up to it, but keep private connections through. And that's one of those benefits that's one of the benefits that we consider as a security plus. However, at the end of this, you'll see that it might be a detriment. All right, so everybody has an IP address for each of those devices. Now what I'm going to need to do is I'm actually going to need to move my network a little bit closer to this network. If you guys can leave your network alone. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm going to switch modes. And the mode I'm going to switch is going to be from real time into the simulator. So come down here to the lower right corner and click on the stopwatch. And when you do that, the event list pane should be displayed. So this is why I moved my network a little bit closer to the other network so I can see both networks as well as the event list. Now in chapter three reading, you guys are going to be going through application layer protocols. Has anybody do, done some of the reading? You will see HTTP. What's that protocol for? Web. Make sure you guys log on to the Cisco's website. Make sure you're reading the chapter. I suggested that you guys read the chapter before the week starts. Read chapter three. In fact, it doesn't hurt reading it a couple times if time permits. You guys will see that HTTP is the language of the web. What about POP? In this case, POP3 email for downloading, and then SMTP is going to be for sending email, right? We're going to be talking about DNS in another lecture, probably on Wednesday. But as I'm looking through all these, these are all the protocols that are active. If I were to grab this little simple PDU tool and drop it on one of those uh, end devices, I'm going to be seeing a bunch of envelopes. Now last lab, that was a week ago, I showed you a way to filter this out so we can just see the ping command. Because a ping gives us what we need. It gives us the ability to test the network and see how the network behaves, right? Very simple tool. Can anybody remind me what protocol houses the ping command? ICMP. So let's click on Edit Filters. By the way, that's probably going to be a test question. Just give you a heads up. What protocol houses the ping command? And you are going to tell me ICMP. You'll notice that there are two ICMPs, one with a V6 and one without. Since we're only using IPv4, we'll only just use the ICMP without the V in it. Okay? Remove the check next to show all slash none. Put a check 
just in a box next to ICMP. Let's click over here in the white area. And as you can see, the only protocol that I have available is the one for ping. And now I'm going to come over here and click on the simple PDU. And then I'm going to go back to my hub network. And I'm going to click on PC0. And then I'm going to click on PC2. Now I'm not going to hit play. I repeat, do not touch any of the play controls. The idea is for me to see how these networks behave simultaneously. So whatever happens here, I want to see what goes on over there. In order for me to see what's going on over here logically, I have to do what I just did over here. So I'm going to come back over to this tool, and then I'm going to click on PC3, and then I'm going to click on PC5. Now you see I have two color squares and I have two envelopes, but the envelopes are on two separate networks. Uh, okay, let's try that. You need to go back in real time mode. Right, and let, oh, go back in real time mode. So let's go click real -time on. Mode. Okay, now I'll do this. Yep. And now click on any one of the devices and hold and drag over. There you go. Okay. Now you can go back to your. There you got it. And then I'll yep. Over here. You got it. PC3. All right. Life is life is good. Good. It doesn't matter. It's just going to be random colors. The idea is that you can identify when they're on the same network which is which. Okay. Oh. It's randomly assigned as long as over here they both say ICMP. You're good. All right, everybody has that? All right, let's hit the forward button because I want to freeze frame this and see this as a step by step. It's going to take some time. Give it a second. What's happening right now is it might have to do some ARP requests. It might have to build its own ARP table for each end device. But eventually, and I might actually hit the, have to hit the fast forward button, these packets should work their way up to the intermediary device. Hit the forward button one more time. How come I only have three? What do you mean three? Six. I've only got five. I need six. Yeah, yeah, let's see. One, uh, did they both leave? OK, we didn't have. I wonder why you're not running simultaneous. Okay, hit forward again for me and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hmm. Let's uh let's actually clear this and reset the simulation. All right, so you have that. Hit forward and let me see if both of them will leave. There we go. That's oh, what I wanted to say. Yeah, we just had to reset it. That's probably because we switched modes back and forth, so it's fine now. All right, did everybody get their packets to stay at their intermediary device? Mm -hmm. All right, this is the first time we've ever sent a message across our network, so you can say our network is new. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. um, that means our switch has no clue who's plugged into it. And a switch will keep a, what we call a MAC table. And I'm going to do that over on this board so you guys can get an idea of what's going to go on in my switch. And that is the following. The switch I chose has a four port, sorry, 24 port capability. So it's going to have a table and it's going to list all the ports in this table. Now I'm only going to list about five of these ports. But you guys get the idea that this switch is going to have 24 entries in its table. Okay? So when that happens, when the first time it boots up, the switch has no clue who's plugged into what. Remember, brand new network. So when PC1, or sorry, in this case PC3, has decided to send a ping to PC5, the switch receives something for the very first time from somebody. And that switch is intelligent. That switch can actually handle MAC addresses. So it's going to get that frame, it's going to de-encapsulate it, look at the source MAC address, and say, hey, you know what? 
I'm going to put you in my table. So anytime a frame is addressed for A1, I will send it out of port 1. But you know what? The switch does not know about the other ports. Because none of the other devices have sent data before, correct? So it hasn't built its table. So in order for this switch to be able to communicate with this PC, it's actually going to act like a hub right now. And it's going to send the frame out all of its ports. Because when it looked at its table, it can't find a match, correct? Since a hub doesn't actually care about frames, anytime something comes into a port, it gets copied and sent out of all the other ports. We good about that? Let's hit the forward button to see that happen. It's, not, it's still not working right now. Okay. I've got one more than everyone else does. Maybe that's because you did that little thing before. I tried going back, but still got seven. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about the, uh, the, the, the fact that this is coming. It left here, went down here. Yeah, and this that came here. And then well, it went down see, what I did is I went, I reset it, and now I should be back. At the beginning, right? Okay, hit forward. And I hit, hit forward. Okay, yep. And then if I hit forward one more time. It and that's where I want you at, right there. Yeah, but it's still giving me another communication over to yep. there. And as you can see on my screen, it's doing the same thing. And it should. Why did this one come up here, but then this one finally get passed right to there? Now, folks, this wasn't my first time using this switch. But on your computer, did you anybody get a message that was sent up to the other PC? Nobody? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I wonder why we, because what it should have truly have happened is that the switch hasn't had its table built. So what I probably should do, and so this all happens to everybody else, is click on this power cycle devices. And what's, what, the, what that's going to do is that's going to actually flush out your Mac table, OK? So let's click yes. Notice I got some red dots here. Uh, I'm going to go back into real time mode. And the reason why I'm going to go into real time mode is so that the switch can build up its table, let it do, I'm sorry, build up its entries. So it should, that is, these red dots become green. If it's locked on those red dots and they're not turning green, hit fast forward time, and that should work for you guys. Earth to the uh, swivel. I'm over here, people. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> it's great when it works, but when it doesn't work, it's over there staring out in deep space. <laughs> um, so that should boot up. When you guys get green dots, go back to the simulator. Is it still recording, guys? Focus. There we go. Are you going to argue with me? All right, so when you guys go to the simulator, you guys seeing the envelopes? Yeah. Now hit the forward button. Nah, now this time I'm only allowing the hub to do it. A little quirky pa uh, package tracer. It worked in my last class where both of them were sending it. Did you guys get both networks sending it, or yeah. was this just one at a time? Yeah, like I said, it's a little quirky. Let me reset this. That's not going to help me learn. So when I clicked reset, it finally acknowledged that both are going to be sent. And what it should truly happen at this moment is that it should be going out both of them. Did anybody get them to go out you to both of them? Again. Yeah. yeah, now you guys got it to go out yeah. both of them. No. So I, when you've been doing this lecture in the previous class and things trail over, you get these little quirks. But it should have sent a message up here just like the hub did. And it's going to have blinking red X's. Is that what it has? Why does it have blinking red X's? Because this device understands frame addresses. And it says, this wasn't for me. You notice this one down here actually accept the message because it was addressed. So initial boot up, a switch has a security flaw. And that is, it will send it to everybody initially. But then it's expected for the other PC to turn down the frame and say, hey, you no longer need it because you aren't who this was addressed to. Over here, a hub won't even consider that, and it'll start sending. At this moment, the PC5 is like, oh, this is a ping request. I need to reply. So if I hit forward, 
both PC2 and PC5 should be sent in the envelope back to their intermediary device. And that's what's happening. At this given moment, I'll be with you in a second, Ryan. The switch is now going to say, oh, I now know who's plugged into my PC. I'm oh, sorry, my port. PC, in this case, 5, is plugged into port 2. Ryan, question? Is it supposed to uh, reset the MAC address when you power cycle it? Uh, it should, uh, well, you got to be in real time mode. Now hit power, and now say yes. Now hit fast forward just so we can get you up right here. Hit it again. Great. Now go to simulation. Now hit forward. Good. Now hit forward again. Very good. It should have. You're having the same dilemma that I have, but it's no problem. It just took time and built itself up, and it's already ready to go. All right, hit forward again. So Whoops. when you do power cycle like this, will it? Will it should it have cleared it all. It should have. It should have. Yep, it should have cleared the table, the MAC tables, which you're referring to. Yep. There we go. All right, folks. So now we're back to the hub and, and the switch, both having a packet being sent from the one who received the ping, and now it's a reply. It's going to go back to the original sender, right? So hit forward, watch what happens with the hub, and watch what happens with the switch. At this time, the switch should behave <coughs> like it's used to. That is, having a private connection between 3 and 5. But the hub, the hub won't. The hub will send it out of all the other ports. So as data tra flow, sorry, flows on our switch-based network, the switch becomes intelligent. It starts developing relationships with ports and their end devices. And then it establishes private connections. Whereas a hub, whatever comes in, gets copied and distributed out of all other ports. Now, a lot of you are telling me this must be a big security flaw. Why? Because this person is being polite and decides not to listen to the frame. What's to say it doesn't override its rules and say, sure, I will start listening to this frame and I will open it up? I mean, after all, when you get <laughs> mail, it's coming in your house, it's probably addressed to a whole lot of different people that live in your home. Why don't you open up your mom's electric bill? Because you don't pay it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you open it up? Could you do yeah. your mom a favor and pay her electric bill? Sure. Yeah. But you chose not to. And there's a federal law against it, correct? a federal offense to be opening up mail that isn't addressed to you. Well, it is a network offense to open up any frame that isn't addressed to you. Does that mean we can't do it? There are ways around it, and yes, we could do it. So one way to minimize that, because folks, there isn't a thing called 100% security. It's just escalating it and making it harder and harder that somebody will eventually give up. If you're persistent enough, you will find a way to exploit a system. Here, we found a way to exploit switches. You reboot them, maybe you can start exploiting them. But after the relationship's identified, because a switch will not put two entries in its MAC table having the same MAC address, only one entry will get that. So that exploitation is only going to be used for initial boot up. After the network is fully converged, that is up and running, that flaw is gone. What about performance? Is it possible for multiple devices on the same network to be having different conversations at the same time? We call this full duplexing. And let's try that. Let's reset our simulation. This time, what I'm going to have you guys do is grab that simple PDU click on PC1, and then click on PC2. This is me initiating two conversations onto So you click on PC1, and then you click on PC2. And then you're going to do the same thing with PC4 and PC5. 
Now there's another flaw in packet tracer, and watch it start working now, because it didn't work in my last class. Now you guys see I have two conversations per each network, and they should be run simultaneous. And that is, both of these should be coming to this hub at the same time, and both of these should be coming to the switch at the same time. However, I made a little mistake. Both of these should not be coming to the hub at the same time because a hub cannot support si simultaneous com communication. Translation, when one person's talking, the rest of the devices have to shut up and listen. A hub is half duplex. Why is that the case? Remember, when the hub receives an item, what happens to that item? It gets copied and sent out to all the other ones. Correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's being sent out to all the other ones, the other ones can't talk to the hub because the hub's busy transmitting. This is like you guys trying to talk to me while I'm trying to talk. I'm busy broadcasting to everybody. When I stop, it's your turn to talk. A switch, on the other hand, should be able to receive both of these packets at the same time. And then both of these packets should be able to be routed, or sorry, not routed, but relayed according to their destination. And in a minute, I'll show you a diagram. But let's hit autoplay, and let's watch this. Notice that we're not getting that simultaneous because it's a packet tracer implementation problem. Did, did one up here catch on fire? Yeah, and that's going to. And that's because it's a collision. Because this one's trying to communicate at the hub while this one was trying to communicate. So that normal, right, right. That's exactly what we're supposed to expect. The thing about Packet Tracer is I cannot see the simultaneous action going on because they want you to learn by step by step. But what they're trying to illustrate with a little fire is that there was a collision because two things were happening at the same time. But we couldn't see those two things being Steve animated. Audio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in any regard, as you can see, it drops it eventually because it wasn't intended to do that. The process is being communicated in a switch. We have better efficiency. We have better use of our bandwidth. Even though it generates latency, I can have full duplex and multiple conversations can occur at the same time. Why is that? Let's take a look at it using a diagram. Remember the old model that we were talking about last week, sender and receiver? And I said there's going to be basically two channels like an upload channel and a download channel. If we are dealing with a switch network, I will have food, full duplex. That means while I'm sending something, I could be receiving something. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to mean I'm receiving it from the person I'm sending it to. This would be an example of a peer-to-peer -peer network. But rather, it just means that this channel is open for anybody to send me something. To make it simple, we just draw this relationship, this point-to-point -point relationship that we have. What about this receiver? Could this receiver become a sender to another device on the same network or even on a different network? Absolutely. Why can it? Because it does not have to be sending something back to this sender. It could be sending something to this receiver. What about this, though? Do you see how this receiver is sending something back to this same device that that node is sending to? Well, that's what makes the switch really nice. It's an intermediary. It's like a way station. Packets will start loading up in the switch buffer. When that channel becomes available, it'll start feeding this. As far as you're concerned, you're having full duplex and you're using the bandwidth 100%. But what's happening is we're building up the stack. The switch, when something becomes available, will constantly be loading data to you. And hence its name. It's constantly switching communications from port to port, giving you data all the time. Not that it switches the send-receive pairs as much as it switches between different senders. 
Doesn't it go in order of ports, though? All depends on QoS. If you have a higher priority, you're going to be getting it more. So it doesn't matter what port you close it. And a switch could be having multiple conversations going on. Like port 1 could be talking to port 5, and port 3 could be talking to port 20. All at the same time. As long as those connections are available, the information is passed. A hub will not do that. A hub will say, look, I'm sending. Everybody else, listen. A hub will generate collisions. This is one giant collision domain. The more computers I have on this network, the greater chance of an accident, the slower the performance becomes. On this network, the more devices I have means nothing about performance. Performance will not degrade. In fact, we say this network is scalable. I can add to it without bringing down the performance, whereas this network is not. So out of all this bad mouthing when it comes to hubs, when does a hub service a point or a purpose. And that is when it comes to administrating a public network. Give me a second, I'm going to clear the event list. And let me switch back over to real time mode. I can just move this network out of the way. This was my network that I'll be using to set up for my organization. And I want my users to be able to access the web. I'm going to have to hook up a router to this network. Remember, a router acts as a gateway to get us out of our network, a local network, into another network so we can share more resources. Now, legally, we have some issues we have to address. Who's responsible for what? Now, when you guys became a student at Corning, you probably signed some kind of technology waiver, something that acknowledges that you read the computer code of conduct, admitting to if you do this, that, or the other thing, we will prosecute you, blah, blah, blah. More and more colleges and more and more organizations are having their employees sign or their students sign some kind of technology agreement. How you are to use pers how you're supposed to use business computers. If you are to check your personal email, your employer has the right to actually read that email. They will not go to your computer to read that email. They don't need to. Because in order for you to access your personal email from your work computer, you have to go out onto the network. So we can put some kind of device to capture that. We call this a monitoring station. However, in a switch network, that doesn't work so well. Because when PC3 wants to go out into the internet, it'll establish a private connection between 3 and the router. And I can't eavesdrop on it without forcing all my computers to go through me first. And that would make it look suspicious. Hey, you're being watched. You're going to try to catch somebody committing a crime. You don't post signs that says, hey, that van over there, we got surveillance team in there. So don't commit the crime. We're watching you, correct? Mm -hmm. So how do we use hubs to monitor what's going in on our network and what's leaving our network? So if somebody's looking at inappropriate material, we can say, look, this person access at this time, and we can pass that information to the feds or to whoever law enforcement body is going to be enforcing it. Our idea is to show to them we've done our due diligence. It's like putting a lock on your liquor cabinet. People can break the window, get their beer, but when you report that, you can say, look, I locked my beer. Billy got into it. I know he's my kid's friend, but I did not serve a minor. They went out of their way to get access to it, right? In fact. What's the handgun law in New York? Can anybody just buy a, hand, a gun? Let's say if you're kosher with the law, you haven't committed a felony, can you buy a handgun? Mm -mm. How old do you have to be? 18. 18? Let's say 18. I don't, I'm not yeah, sure. I don't I know what a weapon. I don't even remember. So you have a permit. So you have to apply for a permit. Yeah. Once you have this permit, I mean, how do you get this permit? You have to take a test? 
<laughs> no questionnaire, just sign your life away. Yeah, you <laughs> if you're a judge you in Tioga. Out, you got to fill out a few forms and it has to go before the judge. Yep. And he decides you're a decent human being. He you give it to you. Yeah. All right. Now, with that being said, somewhere in those forms, those papers that you probably signed, they probably told you <coughs> what you're supposed to do with this gun when it's not being used. What I'm trying to get to is, isn't it statutory that you guys have to have some kind of trigger locking mechanisms on your weapons? Yes. There's and what happens if you don't? Gun. And somebody breaks into your house and steals your gun and uses it to commit a crime. Are you liable? Yes. All right, isn't that interesting? They committed a crime to break into your house to steal something, and they used that something to commit another crime, and now you're entangled into this web, right? Mm -hmm. Because you didn't do your due diligence of protecting that particular <coughs> firearm. Likewise, with your networks. They are treating it the same way they treat firearms or liquor when it comes to causing harm. You have to show you some need to level involved in networks. Yeah. <laughs> you need to show some level of competency when it comes to your network. Otherwise, when law enforcement comes down to you, and by the way, your level of competency is by taking this course. You cannot plead ignorance anymore. Nobody ever told me this. That means your wireless networks, you better start locking down. This is why Time Warner's offering that service for free. So that's why my neck here has a switch on it, right? Yeah. Now, let's talk about this. With a hub, I can hook up a monitoring station. Then I can also hook up a router. And then they can get onto that same cloud. Do you notice that the monitoring station isn't in the middle between the router and the switch? This is being obvious, this is not. And so now when a packet's being sent, not only will the router receive this packet, but get it, guess what else will? Now the monitoring station isn't polite anymore. It's got a god complex. And anything that goes to it, it'll open up and read. It'll store in a database with stamped usernames, as well as their IP addresses, the day that they access it, and their time frame. Now you guys are thinking, what does that have to do with me as a home user? Folks, this is the way it breaks down for you. These two devices might be integrated together, router and switch plugged in together, but they're going to be connected to your ISP. And you know what? Your ISP is going to hook up a hub. And off of that is going to be a monitoring station. And off of that is going to be another router to hook up to another ISP. And so on and so forth. At least that's the way information, or that's the way the, net, the internet is established. So that means anything that's coming and going to your computer is also being recorded. So when you guys access certain sites, the feds will come to the ISP and ask them, we need to see records for this user. Now I've worked for an ISP before. And we've gotten an audit one time. I never even saw the person. I got a digital warrant sent to my desk because of the CALEA Act since 2009 saying that all law enforcement agencies can access telecommunication offices just by from anywhere in the world. So this is a new law? 99, so it's been around for a few years. And what we had to do to abide by this law was we had to have a CALEA machine installed in our central office. And what that'll do is that a judge will issue a warrant and establish a digital wiretap, if you guys will into our office and when they want to watch somebody doing or committing a crime it'll be fed through the CLIA machine to their machine and they're going to be recording this in real time to act as evidence so when they go to court they can prove that this network connection has committed the crime. It's getting harder 
to prove that the user, as in like you or you, committed the crime. Because the only thing I'm recording here is IP addresses, and it's the IP address of your router. And if I have a wireless router, and anybody in my neighborhood can jump onto it, for them to get out to the internet, they have to go through my router to my ISP. And my ISP is going to be recording that behavior. And that IP address is going to be stamped. It's no different than you going to your neighbor's phone box. We call that a NID. Hooking up your own phone line to it and calling the White House saying, I'm going to kill the president. What do you think the Secret Service is going to do? Be down on you about five They're going to be, not on me, they're going to be uh, down on my neighbor. And I'm going to be sitting by with my lemonade watching my neighbor get hauled away. And I got finally peace and quiet. He's in jail, radio's turned off. Right? How can the Secret Service prove that it was my neighbor who picked up the phone and dialed it? Because after all, it's the person who committed the crime that should be sentenced, not the technology. How do we do that? And that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to find out some piece of technology that can do that. Make everybody have a web camera so every time you go on a web page, they're always taking screenshots of your face. Yeah, I think that's going to cause problems. I don't think too many people are going to go for that, right? So then why are we sending people to jail for looking at kiddie porn? In fact, five years ago, a neighbor was pissed off, broke into his neighbor's house, loaded all kinds of kiddie porn on his computer, called up somebody, and said, I think there's something suspicious going on in my neighbor's house. Kids are coming and going all the time. He's a single male. Cops came, confiscated his computer, found he had kitty porn on there, and he arrested, and they arrested him. Fortunately, in this person's case, he was able to have credible witnesses to back everything that he's been doing. And he said, my neighbor has been running his mouth across the neighborhood about getting rid of me. And so the police set up a sting operation and found out that this neighbor does go into people's homes and does those kinds of things. But how many times does that happen in today's society where people who haven't committed a crime are found guilty with falsified information, whether it's digital or the real thing? It becomes really questionable. And we're implementing these laws like we're doing with handguns and alcohol. If you do not show your due diligence by having a wireless network set up in your house and somebody can get in there without permission and cause harm to somebody else, you are, help, you are helping to commit this crime. Turning the switch off is, is the way to solve that, right? Maybe, but then that takes away my features why I have a wireless router in my house. I want the convenience of being able to use my laptop from anywhere, including my bathroom, without having a cable co connected to it, right? So why, can I, why do I have to keep on turning it off if somebody's going to use this for causing harm? See, there's only me at my house. So yeah. I'm going to my laptop working. Getting the idea, guys? <laughs> so there's a whole new world about this. There's a whole new sector in this field called security. And we're trying to come out with a police force, if you will, that actually can do digital forensics and pinpoint somebody accurately without causing harm to the innocent. Okay. So that's where a hub can come in. Helps, but nothing is foolproof. Are you guys getting the gist of between a hub and a switch? Most of the time, you guys want to go with switch, give you better performance, more utilization of the bandwidth, a little bit more control. Hubs, maybe there's going to be a nice quirky side effect that can benefit monitoring security. All right, let's erase one of these networks. Let's go back to real time mode. Let's grab one of these and let's hit delete. It's like draw a box around it so that I'm getting rid of the hub. Hit the delete key and I'm going to click yes. 
Now I'd like to talk about is the in, uh, inconvenience that configuring networks cause for a network administrator. One thing you guys will find out, computer people are lazy. If they can get a monkey to do it, they're going to have a monkey do it. And their monkey is typically hardware, other devices. And one of the classic automizations when it comes to networking administration is assigning IP addresses. It's so classic that it goes unnoticed. In fact, you guys probably experience this if you ever buy two separate wireless routers or even have one from your ISP but then you have an old one laying around and you plug both of them together and you're wondering why computers hooked up to this wireless router are getting onto the internet and computers hooked up to this other wireless router is not getting any service. And that is because both of these wireless routers have a service running on them called DHCP. DHCP is short for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. When you have two wireless routers, each running their own separate DHCP service, you might have conflicts in IP addresses. Now, I bring this problem up because that's the scenario that happens quite a bit in our society. People adding routers. And you know what? It might not even be another router that you've added. Is that you and your neighbor live so close together that when they throw a wireless router on their network and you throw one on your network, your laptop is confused. Because a laptop can't see. It just detects signals. So it has no clue if that signal is coming from your neighbor's house or from your house. And so sometimes you're leaching data off of their network, and sometimes they're leaching data off of your network. Just like I can see everybody's wireless in my whole building, right? Yep, something like that. Yep, that's going to be another layer of it, but same principle. And so in order to configure a DHCP service, we need a dedicated piece of equipment. In this case, that dedicated piece of equipment was your wireless router. In most professional-grade networks, we're talking about a server. Dedicated hardware that's designed to fill the needs of a, uh, sorry, of a client. You saw the model earlier. Let's go down and do that. Let's come down here to end devices. Click on the third item over. It should be server. And I'm just going to add this one over here. Now, like I said, you guys don't need to think of this is going to be an elaborate, expensive piece of equipment. If you have an old PC laying around, you'll be able to do what we're going to be doing here. How do you configure DHCP? All depends on the service you have installed. Now, keep in mind here, folks, that services are software installed on a server. Applications are software installed on a client. Typically, they work hand in hand. Web browser accesses a web service. This is one of the exceptions to the rule. Every computer doesn't really need a DHCP client-based application. They're told to, hey, if DHCP is turned on, then when you first boot up, ask for an IP address, or when you connect your device, like your laptop, onto a switch, onto a network, ask for an IP address then. And the last time it knows when to get an IP address is when you ma manually tell it to do so. So three times DHCP is kicked in is when you first boot up your computer, when your computer is connected to a new network, or when you manually tell it to do so. In order for DHCP to be working on your network, there must be a service running. That service can be installed on any end device as long as that end device is going to be running all the time. Because it would suck if you have it installed on a computer that you turn off all the time and somebody in your house wants to uh, get an IP address and your computer's turned off. This is why we say a dedicated piece of equipment, like a printer. It does one purpose, that is to print. I leave that printer on all the time. That would really stink if I take that printer hooked up to one of these computers and that computer's turned off and I want to print. Right? What other devices should be left on all the time to service the needs of your users? Router. Router, you get on the internet, right? Printers, file servers, firewalls. Hell, I'm out of question. Why do I have to install individualized antivirus software on my computer when if all the crap is coming from the internet, if I can just install one security server, everything goes through that server, it gets cleaned up before it comes to my computer. That would save me a whole lot of time, 
and offer me another layer of protection, correct? And if I were to do that, that would be another device that's left all the time, dedicated, all right? Here's my dedicated server. Let's click on that. All right, since it's dedicated and since it's going to be running all the time, I need to give this an IP address. This is probably the only device that I'll leave on that's going to be signing out IP addresses where I have to manually configure. Another device that I'll manually configure to give it a static IP address is going to be routers, printers, devices that are shared by many. So let me click on the desktop. I'm going to click on IP config. Notice there's a dot next to static. Mm -hmm. I'm click on the IP address box. I'm going to type in 192.168.1. Bob, what do you think I should put in here? It could be any number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type in 253. And then I'm going to come down here and click on subnet mask. Why am I putting in 253? I like to take my address block and divide it up into three pieces. One section of the address block is going to be for dynamically assigned addresses. Another is going to be for intermediary devices or managed devices, like routers, switches, and so, so on. The last section is going to be for dedicated devices, like printers, servers. The only block that the DHCP is going to be dealing with is the first 100 addresses. The next 100, the next 200, if you will, are going to be locked down. We clear about that? That's just one procedure. That's a standard that my organization follows. So I assigned an upper address. The last address in this range is going to be 254, which I'm going to use for my router. Okay. Let's close out of this. And when I mean out of this, just out of the IP configuration. And let's click on the config tab. You see on the left all the services that you're going to be learning in chapter three, well, most of the services. HTTP, DHCP, FTP, DNS, email. Let's click on DHCP. Do you notice after I configure this server, it automatically put in my network address for my starting IP address? Notice the default gateway and the DNS are left empty because I don't have a router on my network. Since I don't have a router on my network, I really don't need to be changing that information. Oh, let's see. It's quite a lot of number of users there. I only want the first hundred, right? So let's come down here and change number of users to be a hundred. And after I do that, I'm going to click save. By the way, folks, it's not as easy in the real world as it is in Packet Tracer to do something like this. You might have to go out of your way to download DHCP service, install it on your machine, learn how that software is configured, and then do so. All right? In this particular case, it's illustrating a point, and that is you've activated the service. So it's running in the background. You gave it some information. What is your network address you should start with? And what is the last limit, the upper limit? All right, let's close out of that dialog box. Are these computers going to be able to get that information on that server? No, it's not connected. So let's click on the lightning bolt. Click on the switch. And click on the server. If you're, if you're impatient, just click the fast forward button. And now we have all green lights. Life is good. Now I decided to start off with what? Address zero? But didn't we do that already? We said one, two, three. How do I know this is going to take, a pl uh, take effect? Let's go back to that server. And let's modify its configuration file. Let me click on DHCP. This time, where it says starting address, change the last octet, that zero that is, to 30. This way, I know that changes are going to happen when I reboot my computers. So let me click Save. Let me close out of this. Now I told you, when DHCP is initiated, when computers first boot up, when you move your computer onto another network, or when you manually tell it to do so. In this particular case, 
I'm going to reboot my computers by hitting power cycle devices. Say yes. Hit the fast forward time because I'm a little impatient. I might have to click that a few times. And then I'm going to see if DHCP actually happened. I'm going to hover over PC3, and it's not going to work. How do I know it's not working? Because it has dot one in the very last octet for an IP address, right? What did I tell DHCP to start with? 30. 30. You should be aware that you can have a mixed network. Some address is statically assigned, some address is dynamically assigned. Why are these PCs not getting dynamic addresses? Because each has met static. Yeah, remember we went through the configuration, we put a dot from DHCP into static? Well, guess what you get to do? Click on PC3, go back to the desktop, click on IP configuration, put a dot next to DHCP. Close out of this, and do the same thing for the rest of the PCs except for the server. When you get done doing that, take your cursor, hover over any one of the PCs. Do not click, just hover. A new table should appear, and your device should have the latest IP address. Now folks, that can't happen in the real world. You can't take your hand hover it over a monitor and say, oh, yep, this is dot 30. All right? <laughs> How are you going to do it as a network administrator? You're going to go to the device. And you're going to configure it that way. You're going to go up to the command prompt. This is like holding the window key, hitting the letter R, typing CMD. When you're at the command prompt, you're going to type in IP config. After you type in the command IP config, all one word, and hit enter, you're going to get a list. And somewhere in that list, there should be an IP address, and you should see the information you're working with. Now, the nice thing about setting up a DHCP server is when you have a much, much larger network, like 30 or more PCs, you don't have to manually go back to each computer and update them. Like, what's our network lacking right now? Ability to leave it, right? to get out to another network. So I'm going to close out of this box. I'm going to add a router to this network. So I'm going to come down to the very first icon in the component box. Click on the very first component. And then click to the right of the switch. And then I'm going to click on the lightning bolt. And then I'm going to click on the light of the quick connect or the auto connect. And I'm going to click on the switch and the router. You'll notice the switch and the router's connection is filled with red lights. That's not because the lightning bolt picked the wrong cable. And it's not because there's something wrong with the cable. It's everything to do with the way my router is configured. My router cannot understand this interface because this interface is turned off. Yep, that's good. So we're going to configure this interface to be turned on and be assigned an IP address. Remember, it's never a good idea to set your uh, router to a dynamically assigned IP address because it keeps on changing. It's like your friend changing their number. You're never going to be able to call them. So let's click on router 0. Let's go up to the config tab. Click on, sorry, click on fast ethernet 0 slash 0. You see it's turned off? Click on the box next to on. You should put a check mark in there when you do that. Come down here to the IP address, and I'm going to type in the very last IP address for this network. That's 192.168.1.254. And then I'm going to click on the subnet mask, and it should give me the three 255s followed by a zero. All right, my router is configured to work with this LAN. Let's close out of the router box. Now remember, you're going to imagine that there are 30 devices on here that you'd have to manually configure. You just added a new router. Now it's your job to go around to the campus and configure all the new changes. That's ridiculous. One of the benefits of a client-server relationship is that since things are centrally located, you should be able to make it easier for managing, right? Mm -hmm. 
I should be able to go to the dedicated server, make one change, and the rest of these devices could get that. Let's try that. Let's click on server zero. Go back to the DHCP service. Where it says default gateway, replace those zeros with 192.168.1.254, the address of the router we just got done configuring. Click Save. Close out of the server. Now, sometimes I wish there was one big main circuit breaker for all the computers on my network, but it's probably not the case. And if you're an IT help person, and somebody calls up and be like, my internet connection was working two minutes ago, but now it's not working, and you are aware that your IT people have made some logical changes in the network, you might want to just tell the person to reboot their computer, right? Because remember, part of the initiation process is to, hey, I'm new to the network, give me an IP address. So you could hit the power cycle device, but I want to show you another command when you only have to do it by case by case purpose. Let's click on PC3. And this is the way you can initiate it manually. Let's click on the command prompt. Type in that IP config command. Put a space after the G. Put a forward slash followed by release. And hit enter. You are now telling the server, I give up this address. You can give it to somebody else now. So you're releasing it. Remember, when you're using dynamic addresses, addresses are dynamically assigned by a lease by lease basis. When I hit release, giving it back to the server, now I'm going to hit the up arrow, remove the lease part of release, and leave the re there, and type in new. So the command is ipconfig space forward slash renew. Hit enter. It's going to take a little time for my server to communicate with my client, but if all goes well, I should now have an IP address for my default gateway. Now, folks, like I said, you can imagine 30 computers. Doing it on a network with only three end devices isn't very beneficial. But part of our job is to actually truly understand DHCP. Now, I need you guys to be aware that DHCP has three components, four, four uh, steps and actually assigning an address. I'm going to show you those steps using the simulator. At this point, you guys can sit back and watch the movie. Because this is just more of theory and action and not, you know, my boss in the future is going to ask me this. So let me delete my scenario. And I'm going to remove or turn off the ICMP protocol. And all I'm going to do is turn on the DHCP protocol. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on PC5. And I'm going to do that release command, right? Release, renew. And the first step, and this is what you need to know, so you want to write this down. Now let me hit renew. Now you notice when I do that, I have an envelope waiting here on PC5. The first step in the process of getting a dynamically assigned address is you need to make a request. So the client initiates the conversation. Here I am making a request. At this given point, I do not have an IP address. Therefore, I cannot use a unicast approach in communicating. That is, I can't say, hey, you, Tom, I need some information from you. I don't know you. So I'm going to say, look, everybody, I really need to know who this particular person is. Tell me who you are. So in this first one, I'm saying, is there a DHCP server out there? If so, I need an IP address. That's the request. So this is going to go to every device on my network. So I'm going to hit forward. It'll go to the switch. The switch is going to act like a hub. It's going to broadcast this frame to everybody. As you see, everybody's getting it. This person, this person, and this person 
It's going to say, whoa, I don't do that. But you notice the router and the server both say, I'm your man. Why is that? Remember your integrated service routers at home have DHCP installed on them? Anybody want to take a guess why this is the case there? That router might have DHCP installed on it. So I actually have two DHCP servers. That's what these two are saying. I'll listen. I'll take care of your needs. So the second step, the step that's going to come back from the server, is going to be the offer. Okay? The server is going to offer an IP address to the PC. People are thinking that should be enough. Two steps. Can you give me an IP address? Here's your IP address. Why is it four steps? Because, folks, if I boot these computers up all at the same time, what do you think is going to happen at server? All, all those devices are going to be asking for an IP address at the same time. And you know what the server is going to do? It's going to offer the same IP address to each end device. I always like using this car salesman as an example. If Ian's interested in buying a car, he goes down to Simmons Rockwell and he says, look, I can't afford $15,000. The car salesman says it's the best I can do. So Ian says, all right, let me see what I can do. I'm going to go downtown, see if I can find another dealer to meet me at $12,000. Salesman says, fine. You know, it's America. You're free to do whatever you want. Is that car salesman going to promise Ian that when you come back, this vehicle is going to be there for you? Made him an offer. Ian didn't like the offer, decided to go somewhere else. When Ian leaves, somebody else could have came in and said, I'll buy that for $15,000. That salesman's like, you got cash? Well, sign the papers now. Do you see the four-step process? You're interested in buying a car. Sales says, here's the going rate. You look at it and saying, I'll take it. Step three. Step four, salesperson says, it's yours. Right? Here, I'm, I make a request. This is going to offer it. At any time that I sit on my hands waiting to actually use that request, somebody else could be asking for that IP address. Whoever decides to say, I'll take it, the first gets it. Right? So step two, the offer. <clears throat> I sort of left my ping message there. I do apologize. I forgot to edit that filter, so let me uh, turn off the ICMP. And give me a second, folks. Sorry. There we go. This is what happens when you leave stupid filters on. It just adds re redundancy to the network. So here's the offer. The offer is actually going to be sent out to everybody. Why? I don't have a way to uniquely identify this end device. So therefore, everybody has to get it. So everybody gets it. But only one person's listening to it. How do this person know it's listening to it is because of the port addresses. DHCP uses two port addresses, 67 and 68. 67 is for making the request. 68 is to listen for the request. Just think about it. You send an email to your friend. That email arrives in your friend's inbox, right? But where does it go in your mailing system since you're the one sending it? your outbox. Same principle. This device is like, yep, that's me. This is step three. I would like to take you up on that offer, the acknowledgment. So it goes to the switch, still doesn't have an IP address, so it cannot uniquely identify or single out the server. So everybody's going to get it. Starting to see some security flaws here. But only the server is going to respond to it because it has a service running that can fulfill that request. Not because of it's the IP address, not because of port address, because it has a service running. So now I'm going to hit forward, and you will complete the last step in this process, step four, the confirmation. It is yours. You can have it. What if somebody else took that address from it? The process will start over again. Will this new address work for you? And you would say, yes, can I have it? And the server will send a confirmation. Notice I got my mark. Now if I hover over my PC, I will get the IP address of dot 32. DHCP is four steps. It's four steps because we're shooting in the dark. I don't know if anybody's out there. 
what if there wasn't a DHCP server on my network? Would I be able to get an IP address? My computer will set up a default, it's usually 127.0.0. something, and I won't be able to communicate with anybody else. All right? I will see you guys tomorrow. Make sure you're reading chapter three.